We're here at Pinehurst, North Carolina. I'm picking Tim up. Tim is the farmer that lives on my farm. He got flown out here by a client of mine, is interested in hiring him for his 25 acres to help develop that. I can't wait to get Tim in there and just have a conversation with him about life and farming. And I think you guys are really gonna enjoy it. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Flip it around. That way. There you go. Um, okay, now I'm going to go back to the checklist. What we got here, so starter is off. IDT looks good. Inertial separator's coming on. Oil pressure is 120 in the green. Ignition is auto. Condition lower, ECS cast. Cabin altimeter, we're going up to 20. I think I filed for 22,000. 24,000. 24,000 feet, flight plan. I'll push that to the panel. I'm here to Murray County. Activate that flight plan. ASOS, initial altitude, I'll go up to... It's normal. I'll go up to like 8,000 feet. Uh, prop feather, check this one. Here we go, torque's up, prop RPM is down, looks good. I checked the uh, anti-ice on the way here. All that stuff worked well. Uh, flaps are takeoff, bleeds. Went on, nav and strobes are on. All that's normal. Got a little bit of fuel imbalance as expected and put fuel in the right tank. All right, we'll taxi to runway five for takeoff. All right, runway five, we got everything taken care of. I'm just gonna do a quick like, quick map study. Make sure we don't break any rules. Uh, coming out of here, I'll bang a left, okay. Uh, light, flight plan, prop over speed. All right, you guys ready? All right, let's do this. Area is clear. Moore County, TVM 975, Charlie Alpha taking runway 5 for departure will be a left turn out. Moore County. Alright, here we go. Alright, 100%. We got 85 knots, there's 90, we're flying. All right, gears up, flaps up. All right, coming left. More county traffic, TBM 975. Charlie Alpha, be departing the pattern to the west. More county. All right, autopilot's on, it's taking over. We're going up to 10K. That'll put us in the clouds. I'm gonna keep the inertial separator on for now. Everything else, let's get my climb checklist real quick. So, climb checklist, gears up, flaps are up. All dampers on, engine instruments are checked. We got a little bit of heavy fuel on the right, so I'll be burning that down in the beginning during the flight, and then we'll alternate the tanks. Uh, at 10,000 feet, oxygen cab pressure, it is pressurizing, it looks good. Uh, inertial separator. Okay. Who are you and what are you doing in my airplane? My name is Timothy Kircheville and I am an 11 year full time professional regenerative farmer and regenerative agriculture consultant and owner of Festina Lente Farms. You and I met two years ago and you hired me to consult with you and help you build and actively farm and run Hidden Gem Farm with you into a dynamic powerhouse of a farm that it is now. Well, we have a very dynamic farm because we have a very dynamic team. Do. We've got we two do. dynamic people Absolutely. in the front seat of this airplane, That's don't we? right, yes. <laughs> no All right, doubt. What does a regenerative farmer and agricultural planner do? That's right. Okay, so uh, a lot. But if I could summarize, a regenerative farmer is looking at a land uh, system or land and water system and is attempting to identify and recognize the pattern language of its natural state and then design agriculturally productive systems to mimic the natural state of that piece of property. I am observing the way water falls on the landscape I am observing the path of the sun. I am observing the uh, vegetation cover 
wildlife, habitat, residences, uh, any type of built infrastructure, pond development, road development, dams, orchard gardens, animals, livestock, wildlife protection. The regenerative farmer looks at these systems with an eye to maintaining the uh, natural ecology or building it into an even richer ecology while also producing food, fiber, uh, fuel. Yeah. All right, I missed the call. Uh, let me check in with Atlanta, then we'll come back. Yeah, I'm still on 127.8. All right, we're checked in. A couple things to look at now, Tim. So we've got uh, GoPro out in the wing that's recording. If you look out the wings, we can see some ice and rain and things like that. There's a little bit of rain and snow up yeah. here that you can see. Yeah. Um, so we're going on the south side of this. Okay. So there's a whole, all this is like a mix of rain and um Rain and snow. Okay. It's purple. Yeah. The yellow is kind of thunderstorms, and the green is just like light rain. Okay. So we're battling a little bit of that. We'll kind of go on the south side of that. But we should be getting to the top of this. But what do you think about this? Like, this is, we're in the clouds. We're, uh, uh, we can't see anything. Can't see up or down. You can't tell if we're in a turn <laughs> or a climb. Like, do you think we're climbing or we're turning? Oh, like, we're climbing right now. Climbing? I, feel, I can feel that we're climbing and we're, and we're level. Okay. Yeah. We're, so we're climbing. We're wings level and we're climbing. Yeah, so it's interesting. This uh, the couple that you were consulting with are clients of mine in my eight-figure group. They yeah. came out to see our farm and what we're right. doing in, in Spring Hill, Tennessee, and uh, said, "Hey, we want to work together at some point." So, what um, we, you talked about how we met in uh, in Spring Hill? Tell me a little bit about like your your farming background. Like uh, you run your own business, so sure. most of the people that watch my channel and are going to listen to this are business owners or aspiring business owners. They work right. for somebody right now, potentially, and they want to start a no their own business. Right. Might be scared. They uh. might be wondering what that's like. And then we got business owners who are looking to grow and scale their businesses. Yes. So um, t what was your story of like starting a business, like the calling that you had to sure. like, leave whatever you're doing before to come into business? What was that like? Oh, that, this is a fascinating story. Thank you for asking. Uh, so uh, when I moved to Kentucky... Uh, which is the land of my forefathers. My uh, mamaw's family uh, were uh, generational farmers in uh, Elizabethtown, Cecilia area. My papaws were coal miners uh, outside of Princeton and Central City. And I decided to uh, move in my adult life back to Kentucky from California uh, and make a life for myself there. And I had always fallen in love with Kentucky since visiting from my earliest childhood, I loved the farmland, and I was called to it from my childhood. In fact, I said all the way growing up that I was going to move to Kentucky. Kentucky, I loved its farms. So uh, I moved back to Kentucky, and I met a man who has become one of my best friends of life. Nathaniel Kramer is his name, and he is the most excellent mason, stone in particular mason, that you will probably ever meet. Um, and I worked for him for a year and a half, and we built a number of uh, types of stone, brick, and block uh, masonry features on a great variety of landscapes, including um, whole university systems, stoneworks, retaining walls, laid a lot of retaining walls with Nathaniel, and that got me terracing landscapes with retaining walls and other stone features, stone patios, stone chimneys, foundations, um, you name it. We did it. So I worked for him for a year and a half. Uh, he was going through kind of a hard time in his life, um, and uh, and I wanted to maintain our friendship, and um, I thought that our friendship would be better served if I no longer worked for him. And it was always going to be a temporary thing. But it, ha it so happened that after uh, about six months of working with him, I uh, visited a conservation site um, in Kentucky, and we pulled back a number of invasive species, and then I went home to the cabin uh, where I was living at the time on a 35-degree slope, and I noticed that the very same species were covering it, billowing over the slope, and I could see some limestone coming out through it. And I, I said, I said, you know what, I bet you that if I pull that back, which I was just doing at this conservation site, I bet you that I'm going to uncover some interesting stone features. So I started doing it and I uncovered the ruins of a Victorian era south facing stone terraced garden on this property. And when I recognized what I was uncovering, I was astonished and I 
felt like it was an archaeological discovery. You know, it was a, a momentous moment in my life. I'll never forget. I was very excited. So, uh, the for the next uh, few days, I, I, I tore back all the vegetation, and I uh, removed it and polished it off and everything, and it was all in ruins, but for the next years while I lived there, um, and for the year and a half to two years that I worked for Nathaniel, I saved all of our excess stone, and I built that place back up into a series of stone terraces, and then everyone started to come over to visit, because there were gardens abundant everywhere with beautiful stone terraces, and I would lead open houses, even university scientists and their students came over. They started a research project with me because I wasn't irrigating nor using chemicals in any of these treatments, yet I was growing a great abundance of food on a limited space. Uh, so they wanted to start a research project with me. This got written up in the paper. And the next thing I knew, five families in the area were inviting me to come out to their farms to farm on their land because they were so impressed by the beauty of what I had built right there. So I got started almost instantly. I decided no longer to work for Nathaniel. He hired somebody else to be his full-time helper. And I started getting hired to build stone um, walkways or patios that were integrated with garden systems or stone terraces that were integrated with garden systems since that's what people saw me doing at home and knew that I had done with Nathaniel. That's how I got the start. But then in that second year, I was farming on five different farms in a single county, and the abundance of the yield was over what these families and I could even possibly consume. So I decided to take that to the farmer's market locally, and I applied there, and I started Festina Lente Farms in 2011 um, as a farmer's market uh, a salesman of agricultural products. I did that for four years before I realized that it, and I realized early on that it was financially unsustainable. I wanted to make a plan. Um, so I made a silent goal. Um, people had been hiring me to come over and teach their families how to raise food and transform their landscapes. I made a silent goal that within one year's time of me recognizing the financial instability of just selling agricultural products for a living, that within one year's time I was going to no longer ever do that for my primary income. And consult with families and actively be hired to build regenerative landscapes and farm and garden systems with those families. And I did that successfully. That was back in 2014 and 15. And although it's been, I say I did that successfully, but I mean, I sacrificed everything along the way and encountered a number of, I mean, it's a whole journey by of that? life. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, what happened? Uh, there's, one. there's, there's the, you know, um, in the beginning, I didn't know how to be financially sustainable. I was extremely poor in the beginning, but I was so passionate. I knew that I had this vision and this desire. Something had overtaken my life when I began raising food and developing landscapes into beauty and abundance. I didn't ever want to stop, but I didn't know how I was going to do that in a financially sustainable way. So I had great challenges figuring that out for years, and I tried to roll with it by selling agricultural products and getting hired to build landscapes here and there. But, you know, there were uh, one of the things that I found that was difficult was that there in Kentucky, in western Kentucky, um, that farmland has really been consolidated by transnational corporate farming. So that's, you know, multi-thousand acre corn and soybean systems genetically prepared. Uh, Roundup Ready Seeds, Neonicotinoid Laced, chemical treatments, and I wasn't doing any of that, and neither was I farming like the rest of the people at the farmer's market. So I was doing something very different, and I ran up against a lot of people not understanding why I was doing the things the way that I was doing. I ran up against a lot of skepticism. Um, I ran up against... Uh, also, this is the other thing that I didn't learn, but I needed to learn. Never, ever go where the answer is maybe or no. Only go where you are invited to go. Only go where there's a yes attitude. So at the beginning, I saw the transformative nature of what I was doing in landscapes, and I thought everybody should do it. So I tried to convince everybody to do it. Well, some people didn't want to do it. You know what I mean? And then there were some properties that were owned by, you know, complex organizations. Many of them wanted to do it, but some did not want to do it. And, you know, so I ran up against some obstacles there. It was socially challenging. And, um, and, and I was also, I was identifying how there were, um, there were great methods that were encompassing millions of acres that I saw that were not regenerative, but degenerative to the natural ecology and to farmers' lives, 
the farming economy, and I wanted to make a change. So I did everything that I could. I, I even tried to help. I did, in fact, co-author an agricultural agenda for the Commonwealth of Kentucky's agricultural systems in a statewide race for commissioner of agriculture. I was so trying to do whatever I could to help change systemic ways of agriculture, but I ran up against a lot of opposition because people didn't understand my vision. So what I learned to do through that s struggle and suffering and the poverty that I was experiencing was I learned that, that I learned the hard way too, that I can only ever go where anybody has a total yes attitude to what it is that I'm trying to bring to the table. And I learned that, which was around 2016. That was when... Well, let me summarize yeah. some of this. Yeah. So number one, like there might be an application to business here yeah. all around, any business, right? So you've got something that you're incredibly passionate about, right. and you're willing to go through like financial struggles, yes. stress, yes. problems, uh, relationship yes. problems, yes. like give yes. up everything. Yes. Just burn it down and say, I just want to do this for the rest of my life, or at yes. least for the, the time being and the foreseeable future, right? That's right. And I feel like anybody who's starting a business for the first time, that's what they feel like. Like um, Elon Musk has a quote. It's very difficult to start companies and, and quite painful. Um, I think that's important to bear in mind. I don't know if that's, that's probably not encouraging. So there's a friend of mine who's got a good praise for doing a startup. It's like, it's, it's like eating glass and staring into the abyss. If, 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 you, if you go into it expecting this, it's going to be just fun, uh, you will be disappointed. Um, it's not. Um, it's quite painful. Um, it's much easier to, to get a job somewhere. Uh, you know, I, I felt like that at times, but I'm like, I'm so passionate about this that I'm willing to just, I'm willing to suffer for the, for what I can, I can see the future, right? right? And so I think that's what a, a good visionary can do. They can see the future. Might not know exactly how to get there, but like, I'm just going to keep taking one step and one step and one step. And then what else I heard was when you said, go only where it's a absolute 100% yes. Like, right. stop trying to, to work a market and a market being like, an avatar, a group of people, um, some a place where you think that your people are, and forcing your ways, your methods, or what you're selling down their throat. That's right. Instead, go to a place that that welcomes you with open arms, and that would be a really like healthy blue ocean type market of people that are very interested right. in what you're talking about and doing. That's right. So those are the things that I got from this. Like these two things, I think are so powerful for anybody who's starting a business in any industry. Like That's right. farming. Info product, real estate, like uh, anything. It doesn't matter. Brick and mortar. Right. Like, don't set up your brick and mortar shop in a place where nobody wants your stuff. Right. Right. And that's kind of like what you're talking about. You're you you saw this opportunity. You saw what was. You could see the future. That's right. But other people weren't seeing it. That's right. And you're like, you know what? Let me just go over here where all these people can see it. That's right. Start working with yeah. them and figuring out how to talk to them. So how did you, like some of your messaging change and some of the people like how did you go find those people that were saying yes we're in we're into this we want you like what was that like? That's a great question and and I'll say that uh, just to underscore the vision that I did have I did see the future I did see I saw both my absolute love and connection with all the lands that I was engaged on and I also saw that in the future we were all going to want to be much more intimate uh, with our food production systems um, and I knew that the that the overall market for that was enormous more than I could ever tap into because we all eat multiple times every day and uh, and our food systems were largely consolidated by corporations that we had no control over so I knew that there were going to be myriads of property owners in the future who wanted more intimacy and knowledge of how to turn their land into regenerative abundance. But I had to learn, that's right, to go only to those places where there was the absolute yes. And so part of the way that my messaging changed um, was that at first I was um, taking my journal, my handwritten journal around, and I was writing in my journal all of my activities. I was even writing poems and I was writing short stories and I was documenting in creative writing um, that which I was learning out on the lands and the farms during the daytime. I was doing that at night. But the problem with that was that a lot of people could see my passion and they might even hear my writing if I were asked to share something, but they couldn't see what I was actually doing in the landscape. And at the same time, I was saying that I was doing things in a different way than what most people are doing. Well, if you can't see it and it's a different way, why should you trust it? So one of the things that I learned was, and one of my clients taught me, um, they introduced me to social media. 
they said, look, you're the perfect person to be on social media. You need to be on social media. You need to share photos and videos of what you're doing so then you won't struggle to communicate with people how and why what you're doing is different. Neither will they have any skepticism that it may not work. They're going to trust you because they're looking at all the things you're doing and it's incredible. All of us who know you and who see you interacting on these landscapes see that it dramatically shifts to abundance in a very short order of time. But the people that don't know you you know, but who might matter greatly, you know, need to see this. So I got on social media. I learned to do it well. Which one specifically? Facebook. Facebook. I learned to do it well, very fast. Um, uh, you know, I take my photographs and my videos and, and I communicated those photographs and those videos. I translated the beauty of the art that I was doing basically for myself in my journal. I translated that to a way that people could take part in it and they could become a part of the process. And when I did that, I was also still market farming at the time, so I was sharing all the abundance that I was selling, and families just started coming up to me at the farmer's market saying, hey, you know, I've seen that you're raising this on a variety of lands, and that, you know, I've also heard that you not only sell products, but you also teach families, you know, um, how to raise food on their land, but would you be interested in talking to us about that? Yes, I would be interested in talking to you about that. So they started coming up to me at the farmer's market and they started reaching, I, I put all my information on my social media so they could contact me. I started getting a lot of phone calls. I started getting a lot of emails. Maybe not a lot in comparison to what I have now, but it started to come in. And uh, I was fortunate um, that um, some great families um, asked me to um, work with them. And I did. And and I was also um, very frugal. In, you know, in the beginning, I, I tried to minimize my cost of living and my expenditures because I wasn't making a huge income. Um, but I never had to take a loan for anything that I did. I was profitable from day one, even though I was still poor. I was profitable. I wasn't losing money. I slowly built that up. And then after, you know, 2014, 2015, now I'm just full-time regenerative farm building, regenerative garden, landscapes, consulting. By 2018, it was really picking up because the demand for what I was doing was enormous, you know, and that's why even when I had to go through fire, uh, the vision that I had uh, never faltered. Even at the darkest, most isolating moments, it never faltered because I knew that what I was doing was full of light and virtue, and I knew that it was going to be attractive to myriads of people more and more to come as the future unfolded. What's interesting to me is I think that everybody who's listening to this can hear your passion and you telling a story and things like that, right? You mentioned social media and you, so you had this journal that you were writing all these things down that initially you were showing to people to say like, read this, right? Yeah. It's, it's overwhelming, right? Yeah. And so then you took to social media and started posting videos and pictures and, and storytelling. Right. Um, so having, you know, known you for the past two years and following you on social and all the stories that you tell inside, I built a Facebook group and you're in there, to, you know, yeah. sharing your stories and things, which is really helping us grow our our market right. and our share. Yeah. So what I saw, before I keep going, it's uh, getting a little dark in here. So I'm going to turn these lights on and we will, hopefully it looks good, really good for the cameras. So it's, uh, it's almost sunset. We got about probably 20 minutes before sunset. So, okay. uh, but we're in the clouds up here and like kind of dark and clouds. So we got the lights on. I'll probably have to turn them off before we land uh, just to make sure, keep, keep my night vision. Uh, for landing at night, but uh, for now we'll light up the cockpit because it's not going to affect us at all. We're all, we're in the clouds, so it doesn't. Yeah, we are. Man, we have a 72 knot headwind. You see this? Do this is I crazy. It. It's just not good. 72 knots in our face. I was hoping uh, my flight planning said about uh, 45 to 50 knots. So wow. this is a lot. We were still. At this yeah, we took off at 90 knots, so that's at, just about the same speed at this that you wind. Own. Yeah. Uh, you know, an hour and 25 minutes still to get home. Um, so hopefully we'll get some better wind here, and uh, I also we, I have I, I'm in the clouds, so I have to keep the inertial separator on. When I turn that off, it allows us to go a little faster. So okay. instead of 280 knots, it would be about three tenths. We're losing about 20 to 30 knots. Okay. But it's really not going to affect us a ton. So this just burns down fuel really fast. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, it's just slow. So, but we had this tailwind on the way here. So oh, okay. It's like a. You know, we had a 60 knot tailwind on the way here. Right. I'm hoping that once we, you know, another 20 or 30 miles, once we get closer to Tennessee, oh. smooth sailing all the way. So this, oh. is, this is the mountain range right yeah. here wow. that you were uh, hoping to see. We are not going to see it. It's all right. So this is, um, that right there is Knoxville. 
Ah. Airport. And then okay, and so we're starting to see the elevation change so here in the landscape. Yeah, you can right? see the elevation. Cool. Yeah, really so this cool. is synthetic, yeah. uh, synthetic wow, imaging that, that we is have. Cool. So you see, we're going flat to to mountains. Wow. And so but you'll see when we come across the runway, you'll be able to see the runway and the lines and right. everything in the screen. Right. So, right. Uh, but yeah, I noticed look, that when we took off. If you look here, we were on the iPad. Yeah. We left here in uh, Pinehurst, North Carolina. Yeah. We're over top Charlotte right now. Okay. So Charlotte's airspace flying over top of that. We'll fly right over Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah. So that's right here on the um, on the chart. This yeah. this little blue area. This is uh, this should be Knoxville. It is. That's Knoxville. Yeah. Chattanooga right here, and then Nashville will be up here. We'll land in Murray County. Awesome. So, uh, we'll fly through some just basically you know the west side of North Carolina and, and all through Tennessee. Yeah. Um, so what I was asking you was uh, to kind of talk a lot about the uh, the storytelling that needed to happen. You were doing it in your right. in your book, and then now taking that online. What I've noticed from you is that you have a way of like pulling people into story. Right. And so you have the imagers and you have videos. You're very good on camera, but additionally, you're you're almost even better in the written word. So yeah. like. Telling a story and getting very detailed, like the way that you speak right. in, in writing is like, it's almost like a like a novelist that is yeah. describing everything. So you wouldn't have to even see the images. You could like read it and then actually see it. That's right. And I think that's what's missing in a lot of people's marketing is actually pulling people in and, and being a great storyteller. Yeah. Like the way that you can actually bring people in and get them to, to act. Because the job of marketing is to have an emotional reaction to get them to do something, the way right. that I look at it. The way I look at marketing is everything that I do, I try to have somebody have a have a reaction, like emotional reaction, and take a step in, right. in one way or the other, whether it's, hey, come come see us at the farm, come to the farmer's market, come support your local people, or send me a message, or comment if you like this, or like it, or share right. it, or those kind of things. Like have Get them to, to act and do something other than just read it and say, oh, that's cool, and move on to the next thing. Because really great marketers, they pull you in, especially with story. So right. how do you do that so well, and what would you recommend to somebody who wants to get started online or, or in marketing and wants to tell stories and see oh, the value? There's, there's no question that in my writing comes an enormous background of reading. So I read very uh, diligently. I'm always reading. I'm always uh, investigating and adventuring in the spirit. Um, I'm always asking questions. I'm trying to learn at all times. I'm always trying to learn. I'm always... I think one thing that I do a good job of is, change, is being able to look at my perspective and challenge my assumptions and come up with a new way, um, a new way of looking at things. And then the reading that I've done enables me as a writer and as a storyteller um, to engage with people on that imaginative and psychological level. So I also studied, I formally studied languages. I did the ancient Greek and Latin. Um, and, uh, and I studied uh, classical literature and I studied philosophy. I named my business Festina Lente Farms, which means hasten slowly in classical Latin. And I felt that that was just perfectly appropriate both to my background in classics and also to the vision that I was seeing for the future in regenerative farm design. Hasten slowly just as the natural cycles do, just as the harvest cycle, just as the planting cycle, or the cycle of raising and tending to animals. So reading, uh, reading good literature, um, reading imaginative storytelling helped me become the writer that I am today. Uh, and I think that it's, especially in our society today where there's so much screen time, I think that it's very important for a business leader um, or anyone who's trying to uh, bring a lot of people in uh, to some complex organizational anything, any type of activity. I think it's important to read. I think it's important to uh, to read good writing, and, uh, and 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 helped me think deeply, and it helped me imagine and uh, feel deeply. And then when I was able to relate um, what I was doing and what I was seeing and what I was observing in the landscapes with all the people that I was working with, um, then the natural storytelling sort of came out. But I will say also that I'm indebted to my family. I come from naturally gifted storytellers. My mother is a teacher of children. She's an amazing storyteller. She can make anything come to life. I've seen her with children just interact in ways that are absolutely remarkable. Uh, she, everybody loves Alicia. Um, and my father, Mark, is an outstanding professional teacher. 
um, and was for 40 years. Um, and he's also a preacher. Um, so he, narrative and, uh, and that background was always very, very strong uh, throughout my childhood and throughout my whole social upbringing. Um, so I'm making use of all of those things now um, in owning my business and in working with all of the people that I'm working with. So reading, uh, like studying other people who are telling great stories, uh, obviously like a lot of people can't just change their family. Uh, oh. But I, my, the biggest thing that I'll say is I think this is definitely a skill that can be learned. And if you learn to tell a really great story, then oh. you'll have the opportunity to really like move people and bring them in. That's right. When I, whenever I watch a really great movie, like I, I, I basically watch movies the way oh. that you read books, it yeah. sounds like. Sure. Like I love movies. And growing up, I would watch like tons and tons of movies. I read plenty of books. Oh. And I was formally educated, all that stuff. But I, would, I love a movie. Like a great movie can draw me in and make me feel a certain way. Cry, laugh, sure. like sometimes all at the same time, you know? And it's like, it's really incredible what can happen. And you really like care for that person in a very short period of time. Yeah. And that's what you have to do, especially in social media. You got to get somebody to stop because they have short attention spans, right? And you write very long form content. Yeah. And long form content is even harder because we have attention spans of somewhere between five and eight seconds right, right now. But to get that attention and suck them in, next thing you know, like I've, I've, I noticed I've been sucked in by lo a lot of long form content, but they got to catch me in the very beginning. That's they right. got to have a really great hook. They got to have a really great like line in the very beginning to get me to jump in. Right. And then once they've got me, I'm there. That's you right. Know? And I, then I'm then I'm, uh, I'm you're engaged in their story. Totally. Yeah. And then I'm gonna I know that now there's value. I'm gonna come back again and That's again right. and yeah. again. Right. And the hook can get a little bit weaker over time, but I'm I'm in there. Yeah. And so that, that's the really cool piece of, of being able to tell a great story. It's same thing with video, same thing with everything that we do. Like, like what we're doing right here. There's going to be people that love watching you, Yeah. right? And they're just very, like fascinating. They either know you already or they're interested in farming or something like yeah. that. There's people that already know me. But there's people who have no idea who we are, right? right. And so my goal was how do I bring some entertainment value? How do I bring... Uh, some cameras in here where we're actually having a conversation sure. in an airplane yeah. <laughs> instead of at night flying through the clouds yeah. in negative 32 degrees Celsius at 24,000 feet doing, you know, 205 knots over the ground. I wish it was faster. We have a 73 knot headwind, but t almost 300 knots true airspeed. We have thunderstorms and, and rain clouds and things like that around us. And and we give some entertainment value to yeah. it as well, right? Yeah. So it's like we got radio calls and chatter and all this stuff, and, and I'm, I'm manipulating the controls and we're having a conversation. Because if we were just sitting down in a coffee shop, you know, there's going to be people that might not get pulled in by that. Right. But now we pull them in, and then hopefully we give them enough value and interesting things that we talk about over the time that they stay with us. Yeah, that's right. right. And so, by the way, if you're still with us right now, hit the subscribe button, hit the little bell so you're notified of our next videos, and tell a friend, like share this. The only way that we can get this out to more people is if you share it and you talk about it and you post it all over social media, just like we're talking about. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, anywhere that you guys hang out, we would love to have that. So, for you, Tim, like, yeah. the thing that you mentioned, so storytelling, is insanely important to me, my business, everything that I do, the emails that we send out, everything. We've made millions and millions of dollars, and I attribute it all to be able to tell a great story, to have a great hook, to have a great story, and to have a great offer. Yeah. And that's really important. You said something earlier on that I am, have been hanging on to that I'm really curious about. You mentioned large companies and like grocery stores and these kind of places yeah. that are providing the food for the majority of our our communities right now. That's right. Over the past few years, I have really kind of transformed my diet, what we eat, where right. we eat, all these things. I had this plan, and that's how we met. I had this vision of what I wanted to see, and we'll talk about it before the show's over. Uh, but I got to the point where I was like, I do not want to eat this crap anymore. That's right. I'm concerned. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know what's going on. Can you talk more about that like epidemic that's happening uh, sure. all around the world right now with that kind of food? And like, let's get into detail, and let's like... Sure open the door to what's really happening and because a lot of people just don't understand and I'll, I'll share a few things that I've learned but okay. I, I think you have tremendous value that you can share to the people who are watching that, of the food that's in their refrigerator right now where it's coming from what it looks like and how horrible it could be for them yeah so it all starts with financial system there are very centralized international financial systems uh, these uh, also correspond with uh, very centralized uh, banking and transnational corporate systems um, 
Those transnational corporate systems, I'll just name some of them of great relevance in agriculture, that would be Syngenta, the world's largest pesticide manufacturer, which is also formally owned by the state of China. I don't know if a lot of people know that. Uh, Monsanto, which everybody knows about, no longer exists. It was purchased by Bayer back in 2018. Uh, Bayer is also a pharmaceutical corporation. Um, so pharmaceutical and pesticide chemical corporations control, in the United States, Corn Belt every year, 180 million annual acres of farmland. There's 90 million acres of uh, neonicotinoid laced, that's a chemical that's placed on the seed that actually even kills birds when they eat it. Um, neonicotinoid laced, genetically engineered seed uh, that's then treated with all types of chemicals when it's growing as plants, uh, corn and soybeans primarily, um, that is then uh, shipped as export commodities or is turned into corn syrup, which then gets put into all types of snacks and other types of processed foods. Um, that's also turned into the primary livestock feed. So most of the meat that you're eating is coming from the huge subsidiary corporations that are controlling the processing plants and most of the animals that are going there ultimately are being raised at least for their fattening time uh, uh, on a on a drip line of chemically laced plant food. Uh, so uh, corn and soybeans in particular. So, and these transnational corporations then have funded the university research um, at the primary academic institution. So then generations get trained basically that way in accordance with those transnational chemical companies and I'm coming into this not wanting to eat a bunch of chemically laced food um, and not wanting to have the food system be controlled by people that I don't know but instead realizing that any landscape that I look at I can imagine into abundance in a relatively short order of time. My life was transformed when I began uh, intimately connecting my myself with the land that was in front of me to raise my own food. My health was transformed. Uh, I had enormously more energy. And I saw that uh, also translated into the people that I was working with on their land. And I saw their joy, you know, impacted and the, the magic of being a part of the creative process of life. Um, and, then, and then consuming those whole foods. Um, it nourishing them and nourishing their children. And, th and then they were excited to share with their friends and neighbors. A bunch of my early clients ended up getting so excited that they started, you know, raising their own, um, they didn't want to even use other nurseries. They wanted to raise their own plants and things like that, their own breeds of poultry and things like that. And then they started sharing that with their friends. And their friends were saying, okay, this is great. Now I've got all these tomato plants. I've got all these pepper plants, but I'm not really good you know, at raising them. So then they said, well, why don't you work with Farmer Tim and he'll help you raise those things. So then I got to help them raise those things too. So it was the excitement of the intimacy of, uh, of being right there with the creative process with the landscape and enjoying the whole foods that come from it, as opposed to just being at the mercy of the transnational corporations that you don't know that are consolidating hundreds of millions of acres of farmland worldwide into chemically treated food. Yeah, I've spent, so I remember two years ago, so we met two years ago, right? Um, and then while we were growing everything on our farm, I, we had, I had the opportunity to go to a 4-H auction in Williamson County. I don't remember if you remember this, no. but I'm very competitive. No. And so Lucy and I just went there on a date night and I said, hey, you know, we've been doing this farming thing. Let's go over to this, um, to this 4-H auction and just check it out. I have no idea what it's like. Yeah. So I went over there and I got a little uh, bid sheet and sure enough, I started figuring out what was going on. And these people were buying these cows. There were cows and cows, goats, and lambs that were being auctioned off. The kids grow them and raise them uh, by, you know, by hand on their farm. And then they sell them for, uh, for a, a, uh, a fundraiser. Yeah. So the money goes back to the kids and the 4-H program. And so I ended up buying two cows and a lamb at yeah. that auction. I got really caught up in the auction, and I, I, was, I started bidding, and next thing you know, I, I didn't plan on, I didn't even know what, to, <laughs> what I was doing. I, I have to buy these cows, and, or what to do, but I was like, well, we could put it in our CSA. We had a community huh. store of agriculture. We had about 26 families that we were providing boxes for that first year. Right. And I said, well, you know, I could sell it to the CSA. I could put it in there. And so I had to send it to a USDA butcher. I ended up going there to picking it up, to pick it up, 
and it got they got slaughtered, chopped up, all this stuff, and, and packaged for us, right? And I went there, and I, I met the owner. His name was Chad. I met the owner. It's oh. a processing plant. They also raise their own beef and cattle, and he's got a co-op of other growers that yeah. he runs, and they he's a USDA-certified butcher, so he... He butchers the, uh, the cattle and then also sells uh, retail himself. And so I met him and we were talking about just beef, the beef industry in general. Yep. And he told me a few stats. He said, on average, the beef that is in, your, in, in the grocery store has been on, aver- on seven trucks, on average, on seven oh. trucks. They get slaughtered in one area, then they move multiple different times. He said it's likely to have been defrosted and refrozen because it's uh, been on so many trucks. Right. He's, he talks about how the fact that they can't actually trace that that beef Animal. back to one wow. cow, especially yeah. all the ground beef. Yeah. It's right. going it's going into a giant vat, and so if one animal is sick, it all goes into one place, oh. gets ground down into ground beef. Right. And goes into a tube, and, you, and there's there might be 30 different animals that are in that. So if one cow was sick, it can it can have a problem throughout a, a entire like giant area of ground beef and right. beef in general and things like that, an entire plant. And so he talked about how they can trace their cow back to the individual tag, the individual cow, everything that goes to your freezer. And so I was like, wow, that's that's incredible. Like I want to learn more about this. Uh. And we got so far as to talk about a product. So the actual product of ground beef specifically and this pink slime. Oh. So pink slime being a ammonia washed beef. So if you look into this, if you're watching this, there's a, there's a process called ammonia washed beef. And he said the problem with most of these companies and growers and everything is they don't have to share what's in the label. So if 20% or less of what's in there is a process, uh-huh. so not an ingredient, but a process, then they don't have to talk about it. So a lot of the ground beef that you find in the grocery store and some of these big companies and corporations is what they do is they use this process called ammonia washing. And what they do is they strip the animal all the way down to the bone of everything. So all, all, the, all the meat comes off this animal. It gets ground up, and then what they do is they add ammonia to it. And they basically wash any disease, any problem gets killed by the ammonia in there. Oh. And then that gets ground down into what you see is this pink slime, yeah. which is it's been wow. you know been kind of coined pink slime. And then so what they do is if they they can add up to twenty percent of that to regular ground beef that you have that is not ammonia washed, mix it together and give you a product that says ingredients ground beef. So the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. There's we'll link a couple videos with ammonia washing and some other things that you guys can see. Um, if you're watching this, and at that moment I said, okay, how many cows can I buy from you? How can I get my family's food from here? Like, I'm done shopping at the grocery store. I don't care who it is, where it is. I want to see the animal. I want to know where it's processed, and I want to drive my car there and take it from your freezer where the cow grew, you butchered it, and put it in my car and bring it back to my house, or you deliver it to my house. That's it. One truck, one car, solid frozen from his facility to my house, and we'll eat like that forever. And so that was step one for me. Uh, obviously, we're eating the the pasture, like the, the food that we were growing on uh, our farm, which yeah. was we had strawberries. I mean, we had 80 different varieties of fruits and vegetables, oh, yeah. probably. Yeah. And so I went to eat my local and bioregion. We had the eggs from our eggs chickens, from our chickens that were now raised. Our, now our ducks and chickens, yeah. So I raised 40 chickens in my spare bedroom the yeah, first year. That's right. I, I remember the chicks. I remember the videos of the chicks in the I, spare bedroom. I, will, I saw them, actually. I will never do oh, that again. Yeah. It was the worst decision of my life. Do not raise chickens in your spare bedroom. It makes sense when they're, like, small chicks, but that whole bedroom, it's, I can still smell chicken poo huh. when I go in there because I'm just, yeah, I'm psychologically damaged yeah, 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 from, yeah. like, three months <laughs> of the chickens being in there. Yeah. But now we raise them in our garage um, right now, so they're in the garage. The uh, garage is warm enough. We were scared that it would be too cold in the winter. Yeah, sure. So we raised chickens in there for eggs, so now we're eating our eggs. Uh, and, and really the breaking point for me got to where we went through, this was during COVID. We started this uh, during COVID. That's right. And what we did was we got to a point where um, I, I was, like, I looked at the strawberries, and they're from Chile. That's right. You know? yeah. And, and yeah. I'm looking at my my food, and I have no idea where it's coming from or how many trucks it's been on. And so this was the story for us of just wanting to, uh, number one, I wanted to create a community, a local yeah. community. Yeah. That, because we didn't know anybody. We lived there for three or four years, and we didn't know people. Oh. And, and we wanted to bring people together. 
I have always thrown a great party. I was always okay. able to bring people together, but I never wanted to be like the person who was like having long, deep conversations. I wanted to be the person who, at the end of the party, they're like, hey, did you see Bill? Like, oh yeah, I saw him a few times. He said hi, he welcomed me. But the food was awesome. They never ran out of drinks. Um, the company was amazing. I yeah. want to come back to one of Bill's parties. Right. And so I'm always like running around. I enjoy entertaining. Facilitating and putting, exactly. getting together and yeah. having those deep conversations and being the facilitator of it. Totally. Right. That's the thing that I love. Okay. So I said, well, could I create this in my backyard, basically? And uh. we backed up to 13 acres. Uh. And I said, what if what if we did that for my community? And so when I called you out and and we built that, I wanted to, it all stemmed from a conversation about having a CSA, Community uh. Supported Agriculture. Right. A, a weekly subscription box that people could have of produce that came from our local bioregion that allowed me to offset the cost of what I was creating to be able to eat from my land, to eat locally sourced in my bioregion so not get sick yeah. all the everything is coming from us the pollen from the bees the that's right the uh the, the food eating from our backyard the yeah, you the, can the see immunity it that we have yeah right and so th it started with the produce then the chickens we got the chickens we that's got right. eggs and then for me it was uh it was beef after that that's right and then that beef became a, uh, a help like a, so now I, we make a little bit of money selling beef and now the beef community also raw cheese we, we, we hooked up with an totally. 11, 11 year friend of mine great raw cheese uh, farmers uh, made in meadows up in Kentucky so now we had that product alongside of our fruits and vegetables and the beef and raw cheese and eggs you know so we were, we were starting to really build an entire diet that you could get and that was it it was very much for me um, wanting to take care of my family and figure out a financial way that made it realistic and sustainable for us to do that and yeah. ha and invite other people into the story. Yeah. And so um, to, to kind of go a little bit deeper, there were 13 acres behind my house. I'm a real estate guy. So I knew that I could buy that property at a discount, hopefully, or a very good value. Yeah. And I used some of the skills that I have learned in buying off-market uh, properties. He had it listed for sale before. Uh, he had it listed for sale for $800,000. And uh, then it came off the market and never sold. And so I said, well, that's probably a price. It sounds like that they would be willing to accept. Uh -huh. And so I went into it saying, well, if I could get this property for 800000 would it make sense for me? And uh, ended up, you know, knocking on his door and going over to talk to him. He just happened is to that right? Did you go knock on his door? Yeah, so the first step. Wow. So I'll tell the story real quick. Maybe it would be interesting. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that I did was I said, let me do some research. So I Not researched sure. the property, the location, those kind of things. Like, what yeah. were they trying to do? with it before, and I saw this $800,000. It's very ah. clear, it's right there on Zillow. I could, anybody sure. could find it. And that's what they wanted for the property, um, you know, way back a few years before. And so I said, okay, this is probably a number that I would be willing to at least you know, entertain if I was buying it. 13 acres in the middle of Spring Hill. Some of you are watching this, and 13 acres in uh, San Diego would be, you know, you know, 20, 30 million. Ah. And, uh, <laughs> And in some areas, it's like five or ten thousand dollars an acre. It should, you know, it should be right. one hundred thirty thousand dollars. This is in the heart of the city, where a lot of construction is going on. There's a lot of growth happening outside of Nashville. True. Oh, so it was great location, and it backs up to my house. Like I wanted to be able to walk back there. Ah. And so, um, a, a little piece of the story that we're leaving out is uh, me and my wife had some had some issues. My my wife asked me for a divorce uh, shortly before that, and. Um, and in all of this, we reconciled, although we had to go through a lot of like pain and struggles and, and deep work to, to make that happen. But I bought her a horse for Christmas that year, Nutmeg. That's a white Meg. horse. We Meg. put Nutmeg on another farm. I remember driving over there and watching all these horses. There's like a horse farm, right? There's tons of horses out uh. there. And they were so majestic and so beautiful that I said, I want to sit on my back porch and I want to watch that horse run uh. on my back porch all day. I just uh. want to watch this happen. I don't want to have to drive. I don't want to have to put the kids in the car. I want this life in my backyard. Uh -huh. I've never grew, I've never lived ever in my entire life on more than a half an acre. Usually it was a quarter acre or less. Oh. And I've killed everything that I've ever grown in my entire life, including a cactus. <laughs> killed every time in my entire life. I've never been able to keep anything alive ever, ever, yeah. ever. <laughs> and so I was like, I can't do this. Like, I don't know how to do this. But I knew that I, I've hired a lot of consultants. I've hired a lot of people. That all I need to do is find somebody who knows how to do it. Yeah. And then that's when social media, in fact, Facebook and that's a friend right. of mine pointed to you. That's right. And you came out and, and, but that was after I bought the property. It was. So yeah. I said, you know what? I don't care. I don't need to know how. 
I just need the who, and I'll yeah. find that, but I need the property yeah, first. Yeah, you, and you had the vision for the CSA yeah. before you even talked to me because you bought the property January 2021. You called me February 2021, and when you introduced yourself and what your vision was, you said you wanted to have a community-supported agriculture. And remember, I said I wanted to feed 30 families. You did. So this is it. We you said did. if we that's could build right. 30 families, we want to be able to fill 30 yep. families, and that's what we want to do. And so, so to back up a little bit, I wanted the property first because without the property, it makes no sense to first. bring somebody out and consult. So I go, I go over there. I write a letter. I write a letter to the owner about me, my family. I'm interested in buying the property if he's interested in selling. And I was going to put it in his mailbox first. That was going to be right. first step. And I had Lucy, myself, and the three boys in the back of her yellow Jeep. We drove over there. And it just so happened that Barry, the owner of the property, who I didn't know at the time, him and his son were working on the fence on the corner okay, right, by, right okay. by the mailbox when you turned in. Okay. And uh, I said, well, hey, Lucy, I'm just going to talk to him. Huh. And I got nervous, right? I got nervous. I got concerned. I was a little bit scared. And so I went over there, and I, uh, I gave him I, – I, actually, I had the letter in my pocket, and I said, hey, uh, I'm Bill. I live in that house over there. I pointed to my house, and I said, by any chance, like, would you – I noticed that you had this for sale before. Would you be interested in selling this property again? Yeah. And then we just started talking about, I asked him questions about his life, I started to understand him and what's going on. Next thing you know, it's like 45 minutes later, Lucy and the three boys are still sitting in the car. Oh. It was a very important conversation that I needed to have with him. Sure. And he said, we would potentially be interested. And so I gave him the letter. I said, well, hey, I was going to put this in your mailbox. I drove over there and put this in your mailbox. Here's a letter. My phone number's on there. My email is on there. He said he needs to talk to his wife. I said, just, you know, call me or email me. This is around Thanksgiving time, just before yeah. Thanksgiving. And, uh... No call, no email for like three weeks. Wow, okay. And I was like, well, oh, man. He's talking about a realtor that wanted to sell it, and he was going to you know, work with the realtor and stuff. It is beautiful. You see no, that? I was about to. It's I didn't want to interrupt. No, it's I'm absolutely beautiful, abs- isn't it? I'm stunned right it's now. Like yeah. It's like the sun setting. Oh, it's, it's incredible. absolutely yeah, incredible. Love it. And we can see above one cloud line and yeah. under another oh cloud gosh. line. It's and like, and all the ionization of the atmosphere here as yeah. the sun is departing and it's moving into a twilight hour. Is I'm actually incredible. going to try to turn off the lights and see if that Look does that how we can see the separation of the noble gases. The blue uh, argon, you know, yeah. and, and hydrogen. Incredible, isn't it? Uh, it's uh, amazing. Like, absolutely it's beautiful. Amazing. So I, you, I don't even get, like, a really great image on the GoPro. I'm going to uh, take this one off here and see if I can get a better... See if I can come over here and just kind of move it around the horizon here. Really see and take it in. Yeah, it's not like doing it justice. We're back now. Um, how high up are we right now? What's our altitude? Twenty-four thousand. Twenty-four thousand feet. So that's about so thirty thousand feet is that next cloud cover. Yeah, it's probably thirty. Yeah, probably goes up to thirty to thirty-three, thirty-four, uh-huh. and then above that, it's probably totally clear. All right, I'm gonna turn lights back on so they can see us. Easy. And. Now, I do that, and then I'm in real estate, so I found his phone number. Okay. So I have a friend who can get me people's information and stuff like that. Sure. So he got me, found me a, a likely to be his cell phone number, and I texted him. Great. Right. And I said, "Hey Barry, I said, hey Barry, I got your fo- I got your phone number from like the white pages and some public sources, huh? I, and I haven't heard from you. I just want to see if you're still interested in potentially selling your property." Yeah. Hold it. To him, that showed you. Two five nine or two nine seven five Charlie Alpha. All right, let me check in real quick. Atlanta Center nine seven five Charlie Alpha, flight level two four zero. Nine seven five Charlie Alpha, Atlanta Center. And so, um, so we well, with with whom did you just check in now, though, Bill? Well, well were, were you checking in with yeah, like another so, one of the yeah, um, so, county, you know, uh, Atlanta Center? So Atlanta Center. So basically, Atlanta the way Center, it works. Okay. Okay. Is when we're when we're up high like this, oh. Atlanta. It's the, all the center frequencies control everything. Okay. So we were Washington okay. to Atlanta and Bio, the whole Bio regional center would be Atlanta. Yeah. So Atlanta controls like all the way to Charlotte and yeah. then all the way west to Makes like sense. Uh, Chattanooga, yeah. and then it's Memphis Center takes it all the way from oh, okay. like Chattanooga all the way to like oh, okay. west of Memphis. Okay. Like so Middle Tennessee is actually in the Memphis Center. Yeah, Memphis okay. controls. Uh, so where we're gonna land, Memphis Center controls that airspace. Oh, okay. And then when you get lower. You have uh, you don't have center frequencies. You have approach. Okay. So like right. when we des- when we descended, we had Charlotte approach, oh. and then we got handed off to Pinehurst approach. And I then, follow. So the way it works is, you'll talk to a ground frequency, so a clearance right. frequency typically, 
We'll give you your, your clearance, then you'll talk to a ground frequency. Oh. They'll let you taxi, and then you'll get up to the runway, and then you'll switch over to tower. Oh. And tower will let you take the runway and take off. And then tower will switch you to departure, which is really approach, same people. Oh. And they have scopes that are smaller. And then so they, and they control traffic in and out of the airport. Oh. And once you get above their altitude, they'll hand you off to center. Where we only talk to center because we go high. Uh -huh. A typical pilot that's flying like piston aircraft yeah. will usually only talk to approach, approach. or right. occasionally center if they're like outside of a big city and center's controlling altitudes of like 5,000 to, sure. to 18,000. Sure. So what, what happens is we get to the edge of somebody's radar scope and then it's a there's three Memphis center guys sitting next to each other, right? In, okay. a, in, a, in, a, in a room. Okay. And the one guy goes, all right, here you go. And he, he pushes our tape to the next guy. Uh -huh. And so he then he takes us over, and he's responsible for us because we okay. went outside of his his jurisdiction to the next guy, okay, or gal, and then we go in theirs, and then they hand us off to the next person, okay, and then they then they'll, they'll hand us off from Memphis to or from Memphis to Atlanta as an example, uh -huh. and then Atlanta there's like four people sitting in a booth, and you'll fly through there that that person's airspace, they'll they'll turn you over to the next person, the next person, the next person, so you leave their airspace. Then maybe you go to Jacksonville or you go to Washington Center or you go to some of these other areas as wow. you fly all around the country. Yeah. So you got like San Antonio, you've got, uh, you know, uh, Phoenix, you've got all these different center frequencies. LA Center, Los Angeles, you got New York Center up in New York, you got all these people, Chicago Center. And then you got Chicago Approach, and then you kind of just like go up and down in different people's air airspace. Yeah. So this is one of the hardest parts is like learning how to talk on the radio, how to hear, how to listen, how to understand everything. Right. And it just takes, you know, take some time to, to understand and learn all that. Okay, so I texted him, and to make a long story short, basically he was like, hey, we, we've we been talking about it. Thank you for texting me. Uh, you know, I've been meaning to reach out to you. We are still interested. Uh, why don't we set up an appointment to come over and look at it? Okay. Because I want to look at the house. Like, I saw the property, but I wanted to understand the house and the structures and, all, and what the value is. Oh. Uh, I feel like we paid overvalue a little bit, um, but I was willing to do that because I knew the future of the land. Right. The future value of the land. Yeah. And so we bought the 13 acres. It came with a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house uh, that was built in the 50s. It's an older house. Oh. Needs work. And then we have an a enclosed garage that also fin has a finished room in it, So and a barn. And uh, basically grass, 13 acres of grass. Really uh, amazing, beautiful, flat land. And then um, that I, I wanted to build a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, a community there. I had no intention to build a farmer's market or anything. Right, at right. the time. It was 30, 30 families. And you were like, we need about an acre. Yeah. You developed it all and gave me the plan. And I was like, okay, let's do it. And then in March, we started. Yep. And so I bought a tractor. I bought all of these things, yep. All, yep. Of these, yep. all, this, all this equipment, all this stuff. I just started spending money, right? I had no idea what it was going to become. Um, but we built the CSA, and then the CSA created a need. It was a lot like your business, right? Your business, you started doing this thing, it created a need for consulting. Right. The CSA created a need. We had all this extra produce. We were growing. It was such a like a fertile soil. Yeah. Yeah. We were growing more and, food and, than and, we could deliver. And I wanted to make sure that we were going to be able to have uh, an abundance because I wasn't living there at the time, and we were training somebody who didn't have any farming or gardening experience. And my big concern, just from my personal standpoint, was that I wasn't going to be able to deliver to these people. Yep. I needed to uh, design. And, and plant something that was going to be overly abundant of what we needed. I wanted to impress people with just how much we could grow. Yep. Um, so that abundance then led to you starting to donate like 250 pounds of produce a week. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll never to, forget. To charity. To to charity. Charity. Right, 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 right. And then in, in about June or early he July. You donated like 3,000 pounds of food that year. You did. Yeah. You did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and then in, I think it was June, uh, it was middle of June, I think, you and I took a drive in your Tahoe down to look at the local farmer's market to see what was going on because we were thinking, well... Oh, so before that, before that, what happened was my, my son, me and my, my son, I was reading this, this children's book to Will. He was oh, okay, uh, six yeah. years old at the time. Right. Reading this children's book to Will about a fruit stand. I think it's yeah. Andy Frazella wrote a children's book. I'll put it right here in the, in the video. Yeah. You can take a look at it. And it's called, like, uh, My Otis and Milo or something like that. It's this children's book about some dogs. Oh. Their magical fruit stand or something, or famous oh. fruit stand. And uh, he was, at the end of reading that to him, he goes, Dad, could we set up a fruit stand out front of our house to sell our produce that we're growing at the farm? And I could make some money to buy some things? And I was like, absolutely, son. Like, if That's you want right. to do that, I we'll set it up. I remember this. And so then what, 
what we did was we we had all this extra like tomatoes and zucchini and squashes and yep. and beans at the time we green beans we had it, uh, we, we had this like abundant harvest and we had hundreds of pounds of this food did and so i'm pretty good on social media like i'm posting on social media at the time i i was i wasn't building we didn't even have a name for the farm or oh, anything yet but i was talking about the csa primarily right. and so i posted on our neighborhood page and like a local facebook group that had like 40,000 people. We only have 40,000 people in our entire community at that time. Yeah. All of Spring Hill. And 40,000 people in this Facebook group. And I said, hey, we're going to set up a stand out front of my house. Would you guys come and buy some produce from our farm? Local. Locally grown. And support us. Gave the address of my house. Not the farm. My house. Which is in a neighborhood. Four people showed up. I... And we were there for two hours. Four people. And I wow. said, and I, I run a digital marketing company that sells info products and understands traffic and marketing right. and all these things. And I said, we need more traffic. Yeah. Like, we need more people. And so I, I had a, uh, a, a woman come who was a, uh, makes her own cookies. She came to buy some produce. She was talking about a farmer's market that she's been going to in West Haven. So she used to be Will's uh, preschool teacher, but she left to start her own cookie company from her house. She's right. been making like cookies and cakes for my kids and our family and all the people that we know for years. And so when she came, she, she said, I've been driving to West Haven Farmer's Market. It's, it's like Wednesday night. It's kind of far from my house. I don't really love it. There's not that many people there. I said, well, hey, if we set something up on my farm, like, would you come and sell your cookies? Uh-huh. She's like, yeah, I would. And, and I would actually invite a few of my friends that also do cookies and some other things there you go. to sell there too there you and go. promote it. So I was like, okay, now I have a couple people that at least it wouldn't just be me and we could cross promote. And so I was like, all right, this was on July 3rd. Yes. No, no, July 5th. It was the day after 4th of July, July 5th. My birthday. What's that? My birthday. Your birthday. Yeah. It's on your birthday. <laughs> July 5th. I actually remember because you invited me to come out to the farm. You said, come out. There's going to be something special. I oh, said, yeah, okay. yeah. I said, okay. But you didn't tell me what it was. Yeah. 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 And when we brought you... But, we had, but we had... But we had... But we had taken a drive together to the local farmer's market to check it out. Yeah, so, but on, but on the, so on the 5th, that was like on the 7th. Okay. So on the 5th, on okay. July 5th, we had that little pop-up stand. We did have the conversation. And then that day, I went back in my house. We cleaned it all up. I went back in my house, and I posted on this group called I Heart Spring Hill. It's got like 40,000 people. It's like 50% of the people are always positive at posts, and 50% of people <laughs> are, like, talking trash. Yeah. It's a typical Facebook group. Like, half the people will love your stuff. The other half will hate it. And there's always somebody, like, causing drama and ruffling feathers. Uh, this is yeah, the way it yeah, is, yeah, like, yeah. on social media in general, right? Sure. And so I posted, if I started a farmer's market on my farm in the heart of Spring Hill, would you come and what would you want to see there? That's it. I asked the people what they want. I didn't say, I'm doing this. I said, what do you want and what would you want to see there? And it, like, in 18 hours, it had a thousand comments. I remember that. In 18 hours, a thousand that. comments. And wow. so I, wow. it was blowing up. And so one thing that I did for you guys that are watching that are on social media, one thing that I did, a thousand comments, but 500 of those comments were mine. Every single person that commented, you replied. I responded to. Great yeah. idea. Oh, that's great. Connect me with that person. Like, Thank you for the comments. And here's the deal. Inside of there, I knew I had something when 100% of the comments were positive. There was not a single hate comment on my post of 500 comments. And so what it does when you do that, when you respond and it starts going viral in there, is it triggers the algorithm of social media to show it to more people. This is an interesting post because social media is designed to keep you on the channel. Uh-huh. They want to keep, so if they show people interesting stuff that stops the scroll, that keeps them on the channel and comment, and like and engages, the more engaging your posts are, the more the more Facebook will, it will show it to them. Same with Instagram, same with TikTok, all that stuff. The, it, same with YouTube, same with YouTube shorts. I've had some YouTube shorts that have gone pretty viral and gone crazy, and it's, it, but it, 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 feather, it like filters down over time. So you need that to go viral in the very beginning, and you need, to, it, you need to engage with those people to keep the engagement going. So that's what happened, that's what I did, and it went, Bonkers, like insane. I've never seen something go so crazy other than people just fighting on there. So, so much positivity that I, so, so what most people would do, what would, what would a typical business owner do? They would say, you know what? Okay, now I need to get an LLC. Now I need to, t- now I need to uh, figure out the setup. Now I need to go get uh, 20 vendors. Now I need to make sure that all these people are going to come. 
Now I need to get everything set up, and I'll I'll do a market in three months or a month from then. Oh, you hit strike. You struck well with iron. That's what hot. you have to do. That's what you have to do. Because there's so yeah. much buzz about it yeah. right then. Right. If you don't harness that, okay, this and Saturday, launch. let's do it <laughs> and launch. <laughs> yeah. And so, so you've got to just figure it out. And so what it, what I did was I said, let's go look at the other farmers markets on. Wednesday and Thursday, gotcha. there were other farmers markets. I didn't even have an opportunity to go to the Saturday ones. That's right. And so that we went Wednesday, Thursday, because I had driven down to help us build the next uh, season of the farm systems production systems. And yep. so you said, while you're here, why don't you drive with me over there? We, we went to see the one in Spring Hill. It was right. absolute garbage. Totally I hate it. Is anybody from Spring Hill Chamber of Commerce, is, or not, uh, Spring, City of Spring Hill is watching. I'm sorry. But uh -huh. it wasn't good. It was there was not a lot of people there. there. Like there. seven vendors, four cars, like nobody oh. there. And then we went to the one in Thompson Station that was a little bit better. It was at, at an actual barn and a little yeah. bit better, but still no, not a lot of traffic. Not a lot of traffic. And so I said, okay, I got to do this. I call the city. I talk to the city and I say, hey, I'm going to set up a farmer's market on my farm. It's a private property. Do I need a permit for this? And they're like, well, like, what are you going to do? How many vendors? So I was like, I don't know, like, like eight or 10 vendors, something like that, maybe 12. And they're like, well, like, how many people? I was like, I don't know. I'm just going to set it up they're like oh no it's fine you can do it like it's they're they're just in their head they're like nobody's gonna show up like it's cool like <laughs> yeah just do it i said well when do i need a permit and they're like well probably when you get like over 20 vendors or so and i was like yeah. oh, okay cool and so i just i put up a post and i said this saturday we're gonna have a farmer's market and on my farm and i hope you guys come and i, I there were people that that said i want to be a vendor i want to do this i want to do that like it was really cool to see kind of the community come together. And then July 10th, five days later, was our first farmer's market. We had 16 vendors, 16 vendors, I think, somewhere around there. We had a couple things to sell. Some people brought some food. Yeah. We had some cookie vendor. We had a woman who set up her cinnamon rolls, and she had a couple things of cinnamon rolls and things like that. We had a jam vendor come, and she had a couple jams and things we like that. we have beef to sell at this time? No, no, no beef. No, we didn't. No, we it did. was just, just our produce. Okay, and that's right. Couple, remember, we made a couple I, extra boxes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So we uh -huh. sold, like, five extra boxes or ten. Like, five, I think, the first week. And then some of our, like, I, I remember our produce. Yep. We had right. another big produce vendor, RC Farm, showed up. And what we did was uh, we just opened the gates. And, dude, no joke, 600 Hundreds people. Of people. When I drove up, I drove up. 30 minutes in expecting I didn't know what to expect Me neither. You know, I didn't have any idea what to expect when I drove in I was laughing I was laughing for joy and astonishment I I just I couldn't believe the amount of people that I saw in that northwestern market paddock that we got I was not I, I was absolutely insane there's people coming in and there's the horses and the stables in the background it was so lively so much more traffic than what we had been seeing when we were doing our research of other markets in the area. Uh, I was blown away, and it was just a big party, and everybody was, it was awesome. Everybody was outside, everybody was talking on the farm, conversations were being had. You know, I came over and enjoyed a bunch of time at our hidden gem farm booth. I don't, I still don't even think we had really a name, but we just had oh, a Oh, we did. We did. Uh, no, no, we called that. So it was when we called it Hidden Yeah, we did, because we called it the Hidden Gem Farmer's Market. So, okay, Because okay, I, okay. I said... I said, we're going to create this speakeasy farmer's market. I did some marketing around it. Okay. So when, when we started talking about it, Lucy kept saying, it's a hidden gem. We, we got a hidden gem. gem. We have this hidden gem. And I go, that's okay. it. I was like, that's uh, the name. Hidden Gem Farm. That's it. And that's awesome. And then we said, said, we'll call it the Hidden Gem Farmer's Market. W what happened was, like, they showed up. They came, uh, like, insane amount of people uh, because of the demand that we built up. So right. when you can build up a massive demand for something, and then launch it quickly. You gotta launch it quickly. You build up massive demand, you have people that want something, you can't let it die on the vine in any no. business. No. You build it up, you launch it. We had 600 people show up. Most vendors sold out within 30 minutes. Yep. That's right. We had like nothing, like the shell, it's like a blizzard is about to come and it's the grocery store. Yeah. Like there's no milk, no eggs, no butter, no cheese, right. like no, no beef, no, it's all out. Or it's like, uh, it's like COVID is about to hit and yeah. toilet paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like that, man. It was like nothing was around anywhere. It was all gone. And that's when I was like, okay, we got something really great here. We need to cultivate this. So we started building a Facebook community. We've got a Hidden Gem Farmers Market Facebook group. Um, we've got all kinds of stuff. I started teaching marketing classes to these farmers. What I noticed was the farmers, they don't know how to market. They don't know how to sell their products. Right. They're amazing at, at businesses. So just like you, if you're watching this, you've got people who are... The artists, you got the artists that can do the art, 
but they're not they're not the the entrepreneurs they don't understand the whole the way it all comes together and that's the challenge so i'm trying to teach that and instill that and since then we we did uh, we had 26 families that first year in the csa we had a farmers market that had uh, we at some at one point we got to the point where we were putting fifteen to twenty thousand dollars of cash through that market, um, through all the vendors and everything like that. We were doing a couple thousand dollars a week when we in implemented the beef the first year. Um, we didn't put the cheese in till this year, I don't think. The second year, uh, right? Uh, oh, we had, some, we had, some we cheese, had cheese last year. Some, we some had cheese, cheese towards the end of the first year, um, and and some of our produce the first year. And then um, you're right. It was more this year that we were really going home with the cheese. Yeah, and this year we've done. Um, I mean, I have it here on my iPad, but we've done probably almost two hundred thousand dollars through the farm this year, uh, not including the CSA, uh, of just beef, cheese, uh, elderberry products, some some produce. Some oh, we do a lot of berries. We we buy some berries wholesale. We've transformed a ton. We've gone from one acre the first year to about three acres, maybe a little more this year. Um, we went from 26 families to upwards of over 60 families this year at one point. That's right. That we were feeding for 30 weeks straight. Um, our farmers market. The biggest single farm CSA in Tennessee, mind yeah. you. There's not another farm that has that many CSA members. Yeah, I know, um, I know Dan uh, Allen used to do a uh, very large farmers, he used to really do, big he used CSA, to do, but they're down, I yeah, think, to like yeah. 50. Yeah. Um, we're going to, so I have talks about 75 to 100 in the future. Uh, potentially, if we can figure out the infrastructure, and, and we're adding in some some farm equipment like a, a uh, cedar and things like that this yeah. year, that I think can. Well, really and also our them. orchard has not even matured yet. I know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, so let's we talk were, about yeah. that towards the end here. So yeah, we're getting sure. towards the end, but I mean, massive transformation, right, in a very short period of time. Yeah. Uh, and so it's really been amazing to see what we've been uh, able to do in a very short period of time, and that's what I want to leave some of the people on here with: is you can do way more than you think you could do in in a, a, a like a, a more of an extended period of time like you can turn decades into days or years yes and so what we've done is we've we've done something that might take somebody 10 years to do and we've done it in probably a year or two years yes with the right people the right infrastructures you have the right visionaries combined with some capital and and some time and, and knowledge and we've been able to really grow something all right hey we're five miles away well we're 13 miles away okay. four minutes away uh i need to turn the light off okay. we're getting about to go in the clouds i need to focus on flying how can people find out more information about you? And if they wanted to reach out, how would they contact you? Great. My social media is on Facebook, Timothy Kercheville. That is my name, Timothy Kercheville, on Facebook. Um, also, um, Festina Lente Farms, that's my company. And that is also my Instagram handle, Festina Lente Farms, all one word, F-E-S-T-I-N-A-L-E-N-T-E -E Farms. Festina Lente Farms. I always love to talk about new farm garden landscape systems.